Please turn your Bibles to uh, Revelation chapter 7, and we'll look at verse 4 as a starting point. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. We are looking at the sixth seal. This is part four of that study. The wrath of the Lamb was let loose after the servants of God were sealed on their foreheads. We learn that the seal is the conviction that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God, the only Savior from sin, and the absolute foundation of His church. The sectarian choices were churches were rejoicing, excuse me, let me say that again, the sectarian churches were rejecting the actual concept of the biblical church, even while professing to be that church. The sectarian churches practice exclusive membership and rejected uh, or paid very little much uh, in the way of lip service to the concept that other professing Christians could be saved and accepted by God even in their different churches. But the churches of the various denominations enrolled in their memberships people that were not saved from sin but only nominal Christians so that their memberships were a mixture of believers and non-believers. And in many cases non-believers outnumbered actual believers. To accept the message of the one biblical church, denominations would first have to openly accept other Christians as being truly saved and members of the one body of Christ. Ultimately, to accept the message of the one biblical church, the real body of Christ, the sectarian churches would have to drop their separate identities and all merge together into one body of Christ, the Church of God. With sectarian identity and prejudice so strong at this time, the concept was flatly rejected and people that accepted the biblical truth were looked upon as being fanatics, schismatic, and worse yet, heretics. During a period of time at the opening of the sixth seal, the wisdom of God worked to seal the servants of our God. Until this task was completed, the four winds were held back from the earth, sea, and the trees. In simple words, holding back the wind means that the Holy Spirit effectively left working in sectarian churches and denominations where He was not allowed to seal the servants of our God. The initial sealing of the servants of our God is called the 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now this is not to be understood as a literal precise number. Rather it symbolizes the qualities of the servants of our God that were called out of sectarianism at this time. The servants of our God are identified as the children of Israel. Now the name Israel appears only three times in the book of Revelation. First we find it in chapter 2 verse 14 in the letter to the church of Pergamos where it speaks of the doctrine of Balaam that caused a stumbling block to the children of Israel referring to the literal nation of Israel as it was about to enter the promised land. The second time it is mentioned is here in chapter 7 under the sixth seal. And then in chapter 21 verse 12 where the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are given to the 12 gates of the heavenly Jerusalem. Now ancient Israel is not the subject of the book of Revelation, but it is used here as a metaphor in the New Testament for the church that Jesus built. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24. We read this, But you have come to Mount Zion. <clears throat> Where is Mount Zion? It's in Israel. You have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, 
to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Also we read in Galatians chapter 4 verses 26 and 31, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, Adam Clark comments on this. He writes, there is a spiritual Jerusalem of which this is the type. And this Jerusalem in which the souls of all the righteous are is free from all bondage and sin or by this probably the kingdom of the Messiah was intended. And this certainly answers best to the apostles' meaning, as the subsequent verse shows. There is an earthly Jerusalem, but this earthly Jerusalem typifies a heavenly Jerusalem. The former with all her citizens is in bondage. The latter is a free city, and all her inhabitants are free also. And this Jerusalem is our mother. It signifies the Church of Christ, the metropolis of Christianity, or rather the state of liberty into which all true believers are brought. And then Galatians chapter 6 is verse 6, excuse me, verse 15 and 16. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. All that have experienced the new creation in Christ are the Israel of God. Albert Barnes comments on the Israel of God. He says, the true church of God and all who are his true worshipers. The servants of our God, those here called the children of Israel, are nothing more than the church of God, built by Jesus Christ upon the seal they receive on their foreheads. The revelation that he is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, as we learned that seal is. The visible churches of men rely on their respective modes of membership, and they vouch that those that join their churches are assured of a place with God for eternity. The Church of God, the Israel of the Revelation, relies solely on the atonement in Christ for salvation from sin and the assurance of eternity with God, not some organizational membership in some organized church. As said earlier, the 144,000 is not to be understood as a literal number. It is a number denoting perfection in the kingdom of God. Historic Israel consisted of 12 tribes descended from the sons of Jacob to whom God gave the name Israel. One cannot read the books of Moses without constantly running into the names of Jacob's 12 sons and the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, one of Jacob's sons was named Levi. However, the tribe of Levi is not listed in the catalog of the 12 tribes, and there is a reason for this. And this is because God separated the tribe of Levi from all the other Israelites and gave to them the priesthood and the service of the temple. That was their inheritance, not land in the land of Canaan. In the catalog of the tribes of Israel, there is no tribe of Joseph. Instead, his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, became individual tribes in recognition of Joseph and how God especially used him to save Israel in the time of severe famine. But there is a peculiarity in the list of the tribes as it is presented here in the sixth seal. You'll notice 
the first tribe named is Judah. Reuben was actually the firstborn son of Leah, the first wife of Jacob. And he would normally be listed first in the name of the tribes. Reuben, however, is demoted to second and surpassed by Judah because of what is said in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, where it says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Yet Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph's. Judah was actually the fourth son of Leah, yet he prevailed over all his brothers. The ruler mentioned here in Chronicles is King David, who clearly understood what was expressed in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 4, where it is written, However, the Lord God of Israel chose me above all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. This is David speaking. For he has chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he was pleased with me to make me king over all Israel. The reason the tribe of Judah is listed first in the catalog of the tribes under the sixth seal is because it is the tribe from which Christ descended. And he is the head of his church and he is the king in the kingdom of heaven. Gad and Asher follow Reuben and were the two sons of Leah's maid, Zilpah. Now actually, Rachel's maid, Bilhah, had a baby before Zilpah. But since Zilpah was the maid of Jacob's first wife, her children rank higher than the maid of Israel's children. Now the next is Naphtali, the second son of Rachel's maid, Bilhah. And that was her first, excuse me, her first son, Dan, is not mentioned in this catalog because he, Dan was one of the principal promoters of idolatry in ancient Israel. So when we're looking at the church of God, the biblical church being restored in the sixth seal, the tribe of Dan is omitted because he was an idolater and there's no idolaters in the church of the living God. We all are the redeemed. Uh, Manasseh, the son of Joseph, is listed in the place of Dan. Next follow Simeon, Levi, Issachar, and Zebulun, the remaining sons of Leah. Finally, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel, are listed, which were the youngest sons of Jacob. If you've noticed, another son is missing from this list. Another tribe is missing from this list. Ephraim. Why? This is the tribe that took the lead in dividing the kingdom of Israel after the death of King Solomon. No division is permitted in the biblical church. And as was Dan, the tribe of Ephraim was a promoter of idolatry in Israel, and the tribe of Ephraim was the seed of the despised Samaritans. If you've read the New Testament, you know about the Samaritans. Now, the perfection in the kingdom of God is represented by the compound of the 12,000 sealed out of each of the 12 tribes as listed. In other words, we have 12 tribes, we have 12,000 from each tribe, that equals 144,000. So why 12,000 from each tribe? Barnes suggests the following answer. He writes, this, the number 12,000, refers to the Christian church and means in connection with what follows that each portion of the church would furnish a definite part of the whole number sealed and saved. 
we are not required to understand this of the exact number of 12,000, but that the designation would be made from all parts and branches of the church as if a selection of the true servants of God were made from each, excuse me, were made from the whole number of the tribes of Israel. And we might expand on what Barnes wrote and say that the 144,000 symbolizes the totality of the servants of our God that were sealed and caught up like the scroll that was ro uh, rolled up and we saw in chapter 6 verse 14. The 144,000 represent, in other words, the first people from around the world to take a stand out of the sectarian visible church at large. In the United States of America, a movement formed around a holiness paper, paper titled The Gospel Trumpet, edited by a man named Daniel Warner. Now, Warner was not unknown in history. Kenneth Latteret mentions Warner in his book, Christianity in a Revolutionary Age. Now, Warner had fought in the Civil War and was converted to Christianity shortly after being separated from the Union Army. His first church association was with the Weinbrunnerian Church of God that we mentioned in our last lecture as one of the leading elements of the primitive church movement in the United States. Latteret writes, in the 1870s, a division occurred in the general eldership of the Churches of God, that's the Weinbrunnerian Church. It was led by D.S. Warner, who was expelled from that body for what it deemed heretical views. He taught entire sanctification as a second work of grace divine healing, and extreme asceticism. Those who followed him rejected all creeds, recognized the Lord's people in all denominations, and sought to bring about the identity, or at least the possible identity, of the visible and the invisible church. The Weinbrunnerian Church of God rejected the teaching of entire sanctification leading Warner to question whether this was actually the true Church of God. He wrote in his diary, on the 31st of last January, and that was 1878, the Lord showed me that holiness could never prosper upon sectarian soil encumbered by human creeds and party names. And he gave me a new commission to join holiness and all truth together and build up the apostolic church of the living God. Warner, with just five other like-minded Christians, left the Weinbrunnerian church to be just the biblical church in 1881. As the gospel trumpet carried the message across the continent, masses of people and entire congregations came out of their sectarian churches to be just the biblical church. And within 20 years, two decades, the gospel trumpet carried the message around the world, prompting how many only God knows to take like stands for the church built on the rock, Jesus Christ. The Church of God Reformation movement that ensued from this moving of God, sad to say, eventually took a somewhat sectarian stand on the message of the biblical church by seeing itself only as the object of God's working under the sixth seal and in other parts of the book of Revelation. That was not a good thing that happened. Now, chapter 7, verses 9 through 10 of the book of Revelation show us that in due time the servants of our God were sealed, resulting in a great multitude rejoicing and praising God for salvation. The Bible says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, not just 144,000, that's a pretty, pretty good sized group of people, but a great multitude well, how many in a great multitude, which no one could number, 
of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The truth was accepted not just by the symbolic 144,000, but by a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Now while this sixth seal is called the day of the Lamb's wrath, these people are found standing around the throne praising God and praising the Lamb. And this is quite different from the people that were calling on the mountains and the rocks to hide them from the Lamb and His wrath, as we saw at the opening of the sixth seal. This is reminiscent of what is seen in chapter 5, where the Lamb is celebrated at the heavenly throne. We see there a crowd that was singing essentially the same song as we see here in the sixth seal. They were singing, You were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Sound familiar? So here in the sixth seal, the crowd sings the second verse of that song. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Chapter, excuse me, verse 4 of the seventh chapter actually identifies the location of this celebration as the very throne in chapter 5. It says, All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. If you go back to the fifth chapter, you see it's exactly the same place, the same scene. All the angels, excuse me, but the statement, all angels, is to be understood as the ministry God used to bring out the message of the biblical church and its distinction from all the churches organized and run by men. Churches where Jesus is not the head. These angels are in fact the four angels holding back the four winds in verse 1 and the angel of wisdom we see in verse 2. All the angels, the elders, and the four living creatures fall on their faces to worship God just as they did in chapter 5. And they sing this song recorded in verse 12 of chapter 7. Amen. Blessed and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever Amen. And this is essentially the same song as sung in chapter 5, verse 13, where it says, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. What is seen under the sixth seal is the restor restoration of the church as built by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not just an organization. It is not just a fellowship or a group calling itself the Church of God. It is the restoration of on this rock, I will build my church as spoken by Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. It is the restoration of the full gospel of salvation from sin and holiness of life through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, solely by faith in Christ and the unbridled Word of God, which produces a called out assembly of all that have the like common experience. It is, in fact, the fulfillment of Jesus' prayer as recorded in John chapter 17, verse 11, 22 to 23, where he prays, Holy Father, Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, 
that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Well, the scene seems to lay, leave the Apostle John somewhat speechless and in awe. In the vision, an elder, one of those who are around the throne, comes to John and asks him who these people are as if John should know. The scene takes place well over a millennium, millennium and a half in John's future. So his response is, sir, you know. Today, we would just say, I don't know. <laughs> but that was a polite way to say, I don't know. In fact, Adam Clark helps us to understand the statement. The simple meaning of the phrase, thou knowest, is that he who had asked the question must be better informed than he to whom he had proposed it. It is on the part of John a modest confession that he did not know or could not be presumed to know. And at the same time, the respectful utterance of an opinion that he who addressed this question to him must be in possession of this knowledge. So John answers this elder, or excuse me, the elder answers John. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Verses 11 through 17. The book of Revelation is the story of things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. That's what John was told in chapter 1, verse 19. Through the seals, John saw the church in its original glory, the things you have seen. The church beginning to fall away, the things which are, and the sad decline and the slow recovery from apostasy the things which will take place. The sixth seal shows the restoration of the biblical church in its true perspective, not as a mere religious organization, but as the logical and inevitable result of the experience of salvation, the real calling out of God's people from a life of sin to a life of holiness and unity in the one body of Christ. The sixth seal is the day of the Lamb's wrath. But for those that follow him and serve him day and night, their lives are anything but the subject of wrath. They are in fact comforted by the Lamb. Verses 16 to 17 says, They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The sixth seal we learned opened around 1800 AD and continues for an indefinite time. Those that are caught up in the wrath of the Lamb during this time are oblivious to what the glorified Christ is doing. Meanwhile, during this time, the glorified Christ is gathering a people for his name. The glory seen only by them continues until the opening 
of that mysterious seventh seal, which we will begin to consider in our next lesson. Amen.